Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel, I'm an airline pilot and in today's video let's have a quick discussion about how your engine thrust affects your takeoff speeds. I saw quite a little bit of confusion amongst flight simmers when I said that the fixed takeoff speeds that are not influenced by thrust setting that you get on quite a couple of add-ons are not really correct because it seems that many flight simmers don't seem to understand the correlation between your takeoff speeds and the engine thrust. So let's go into a little bit of detail about that on today's video. Now we're standing here in an Airbus A319 for a quick ferry flight over from Dusseldorf to Cologne. You can see we only got like four tons of fuel on board. Our gross weight is 44 tons. So obviously with that we could expect rather low takeoff speeds and indeed that is what we get down here. However, why are they so low and how can we um, still expect higher speeds under different conditions? So, first of all, why are they so low? Well, obviously the airplane has a light weight, so the takeoff speeds must be low, right? Well, almost. The primary reason over here is that we not only have a rather low weight, but what does the low weight imply? Well, the airplane needs less lift. Yeah, to a certain extent. But you always need to keep in mind the other large effect of takeoff speeds. And that other effect is the takeoff speeds determine how much of a control input you can make through your control surfaces. So we've got things like the rudder, we've got the ailerons, and we got the elevators. Now the elevators can sort of be taken out of the equation over here. The important thing will be the rudder and the ailerons and respectively the roll spoilers. Now, when calculating takeoff data, we always take into account the worst possible scenario, and that is usually an engine failure at V1. Now, we need to think about this. Every airplane has a minimum control speed on the ground and a minimum control speed in the air. Those speeds are defined as being able to hold your direction without an excessive use of um, nose wheel steering or bank angle respectively. So on the ground you need to be able to maintain your uh, centerline or rather maintain a certain distance from the centerline in case an engine failure happens while still having positive control over the aircraft using aerodynamic surfaces only. So nose wheel steering must not be used for that. Kind of logical but still worth mentioning. Likewise in the air you must be able to maintain your heading with the use of primary con flight controls, so rudder and ailerons without using more than a set degree of uh, bank angle. Now, that's basic ATBL theory over there. Now, in order to be able to actually maintain this, obviously the control surfaces need to be able to develop enough energy. And how do they do that? Well, you need a certain minimum amount of air flowing over them for the control surfaces to be able to exercise a certain pressure. So for example, if we do a full rudder deflection to the right over here and have a look at that right from behind, then we can see that the area of the rudder is given. But the effect this has on the controllability of the airplane is going to be stronger the faster the airplane is. That's the reason why as soon as we are building up speed and when we're getting up to cruising levels, the maximum rudder deflection is going to be severely limited by the flight controls. We can see that in the um, flight control page on the ECAM here with those green markings on the side which are going to get more and more narrow the, the faster our airplane is going to fly. Now, likewise the same applies for our ailerons as well where we only have a certain given deflection. Now, this has an effect on the takeoff run of the airplane. Most notably, the slower you are when that engine failure happens the stronger your rudder needs to be. That is the reason why, for example, the Airbus A318 has a larger rudder or a larger um, vertical stabilizer than the larger parts of the A320 family, namely the 319 through 321. The simple reason is that due to the um, small length of the airplane and due to the rudder therefore having less of a turning moment, it needed to be larger in order to be able to develop the same force in case an engine failure happens. Now, that much for the basic theory of why the takeoff thrust has an influence on the takeoff speeds. 
Naturally, the um, V1 needs to be above the minimum control speed on the ground because we need to keep in mind that in case an engine failure happens at V1, we need to continue the takeoff run all the way to get airborne. Naturally, we need to be able to control the airplane when that happens. Therefore, V1 always needs to be greater to or equal than the minimum control speed on the ground in theory, and in practical terms, by regulations, V1 actually needs to have a certain factor of the minimum control ground speed. Likewise, the same accounts for V2, which needs to be greater than the minimum control speed in the air, so that when we are maintaining V2 with an engine failure, we need to be able to maintain our heading and not drift uncontrollably to a side. Now, why does our flex temperature, or rather our takeoff thrust, have an influence then? And how is the influence of that made up? Now, we're going to start easily with the Airbus A320 family. In the A320 family, you can only reduce your takeoff thrust through the flex takeoff feature. So, you tell the airplane that it is warmer than it actually is. That is going to calculate the maximum thrust based on this temperature now, thereby reducing the amount of thrust output for your engine for the takeoff. The immediate effect of that is less thrust on takeoff. And if you've got less thrust and you now look at the airplane from above, you will notice that in case an engine fails, all of a sudden there is less of a force pushing the airplane to a side. Now with less force pushing it to a side, you also need less force on your rudder in order to counteract that pushing moment to the side. Therefore, with less takeoff thrust selected, you need or you can use a lower V1 than with a higher thrust setting. However, there is one problem with that. When a flex takeoff feature is used, then your takeoff thrust is limited, but the pilots could at any point still move the thrust levers all the way into the toga position to get full thrust back. Remember, it's only one notch that you need to move it further in order to gain the um, full amount of thrust. Likewise, if you were flying a Boeing aircraft, it's just a second press of the toga button away. Now, this means that when using a flex takeoff feature or assumed temperature in a Boeing, V1 still needs to be calculated based on the minimum control speeds, likewise V2, based on the minimum control speeds for maximum toga thrust. Now this is basically where the explanation ends on A320 aircraft. However, it would be too easy to just keep it at that. So let's have a look at, into the A330 and any Boeing aircraft now. So the white body Airbuses, as well as the um, pretty much all Boeing aircraft equipped with an FMS have a so-called fixed D-rate feature. Now, fixed D-rate, as the name implies, is a fixed amount of D-rate above which the thrust may not be increased unless immediate contact with the terrain is imminent. In other words, if you use a fixed D-rate compared to a flex temperature, that fixed D-rate is an upper limit of thrust to be used. Now, Let's say we take the takeoff EPR of 1.364 that is calculated for this takeoff with the A319. When we take this EPR and assume that we were using a fixed D rate, limiting the maximum thrust to this amount over here, then we could now use a lower minimum control speed because there would be less of a force that we need to counteract in case of an engine failure. When we do that, then we can take a lower V1 and we can also take a lower V2 since there is going to be less force needed on the control surfaces in order to counteract a possible engine failure. Now, this also means that VR, which is limited by V1 and V2, can also be lower. So in total, if you used a fixed D-rate in order to have less maximum usable takeoff thrust available, then your takeoff speeds can be lower. Now, this might be beneficial if you have a very short runway, for example. Now, as many of you know from your experience with Boeing aircraft, there is also a combination of flex takeoff or assumed temperature, as it's called in Boeing, and a fixed D-rate possible. Now, what you see a lot of times in a 737, for example, is that you're going to use a D-rate to take off two, together with, for example, 30 degrees of assumed temperature. Now, why would you combine the two, and what is favorable then? 
Well, we are looking for the lowest possible, well, not the lowest possible, but a good compromise between um, low takeoff speeds and high takeoff speeds. So something about 130 to 140 knots usually turns out to be the ideal scenario in the 737. Now, if you were to take only assumed temperature or only flex temperature over the combination of the two, then you would get higher takeoff speeds because of the possible higher takeoff thrust. If you were to take only flex takeoff without any assumed temperature, then you would limit yourself in terms of what can be done safety-wise in case you do encounter an engine failure and want to increase thrust above what is calculated. Now, to be entirely clear, the takeoff thrust calculated is going to be safe in case an engine failure happens. So when your onboard performance tool gives you a certain takeoff thrust, then in case of a, an engine failure at V1, at the, which is normally the worst possible um, condition, then you are still going to be safe in order to clear any obstacles. But the rate of climb can sometimes be rather limited. Now, for that reason, it is always allowed to increase thrust up to the maximum rated limit of the engine. Now, when you're only using a flex temperature or assumed temperature, the maximum rated thrust is basically the maximum rated thrust that the engine can take. However, when you're using a fixed D-rate, that maximum rated thrust now decreases to the fixed D-rate. Therefore, you have less thrust available in case of an engine failure. Now, all flight crew manuals are going to allow the pilot in command to decide to overrule that fixed D-rate and increase thrust to the maximum the engine can take in case immediate um, terrain contact is imminent. Now, you need to understand though that your takeoff speeds are calculated based upon this reduced thrust. So, if you were to increase your thrust above the limit, there is a chance that airplane control could become difficult to impossible. So, that is what the pilot in command needs to take into account when deciding to overrule the fixed D rate. Now, the basic message of this, however, is in case you've got an A320 family aircraft, no problem. You only have flex takeoff. You don't have fixed D-rates. So, all we need to understand here is that the effect on takeoff speeds of the reduced thrust is marginal. However, as soon as fixed D-rates come into play, the effect the reduced takeoff thrust is going to have on your takeoff speed is going to become more and more prominent. I do hope this sheds a little bit of light into what is going on in the background there when you've got an airplane that is using reduced thrust for the takeoff. And I do hope this sheds a little bit of light into why it may not always be that easy just to take a certain fixed takeoff speed for a certain weight and go flying with that. There is a little bit more theory going into it. And overall, it is going to be up to the airline to determine which policy to follow, and thereby the airline is going to determine what is the best course of action, and therefore how the onboard performance tool is going to be programmed. For example, in my former airline on the Boeing 737, the use of fixed D rates was maximized in order to get the takeoff speeds lower, and in my new airline flying the A330, which is also fixed D rate equipped, the use of fixed D-rates is actually not allowed at all because they want us to calculate the takeoff so that maximum thrust is always safely available. Now, thank you very much for listening, everyone. I do hope that you enjoyed this little excursion into performance theory and into why takeoff speeds are the way they are and what effect your takeoff thrust has on the takeoff speeds. I do hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then be sure to leave a comment in the comment section below the video and be sure to leave a like in YouTube as it does really help out the channel. Finally, if you're up for more, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and if you really love what I'm doing, I would appreciate a small donation through the Buy Me A Coffee link in the video description below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you all again on the next one.